Butter Pot Jerome and the Journey to Rawl, written and illustrated by L. B. Wynn. Though they'd only been friends for two crazy days, the pair made a pretty good team. Jerome loved his giffle, his magical ring, but to fly on a zark was his dream. Missy asked, Why is leaving your world not allowed? Jerome frowned. You won't like what you hear. A strange thing is happening here in Gabul. Sometimes Gabulians will just disappear. We pay Buntal Wag everything that we earn to keep us all safe and protected. So he has decreed no Gabulians may leave and makes sure we do as he's directed. What is wrong with my giffle? I truly don't know. Maybe now it will work just like new. We must go talk to Wag so you can go home. We'll tell him our tale. He'll know what to do. Mitzi explained. But you don't understand. I'm not sure that I want to return. I really have no one who needs me on Earth. It's wonderful here. There's so much to learn. Now the dark and the scary thing they did not know was that Wag was already aware that the two friends were coming to tell him their woes. Wag was planning to poison the pair. Since Mitzi was not a Gabulian by birth, Wag feared she'd discover his dealings. He knew he had to eliminate her, and he really had no guilty feelings. Yes, the great Bunta Wag was not great, not at all. All he thought of was Ruzel's rich stone. He'd created a poison to make all forget how to live and to think on their own. Each night, when the Wantada breeze would drift by, Wag released nasty poison into it. The creepy green stuff spread out over Gabul through the air, but nobody knew it. And as the Gabulians were breathing it in, happy memories were being erased. They couldn't remember too far in the past, or Gabul ways which they once embraced. Wag told the Gabulians they'd better obey. If they didn't, they might disappear. They'd forgotten that's what they always had done. It was something they'd all learned to fear. Yes, down on Gabul, it's a normal event. Disappearing is just what they do. I'm leaving this story right now for a bit to explain their life cycle to you. Now pay close attention and soon you will know the most magical life of each soul. They fall from a lunapod when they are born. Butter pods help each new one to grow. And thus they are Butterpods faithful and kind, the youngest of all on the planet. The reason a giffle works only for them is they're young enough to believe in it. Now when a Butterpod stops his believing that giffles have truly great power, it means he's too old to remain Butterpod. He patinks. It takes more than an hour. And what does patink mean? I knew you would ask, so I'm going to answer you true. It's when the small Butterpod must be alone and then disappears right out of the blue. They become a small light, too small to be seen, and they stay that way for a few days. Then still all alone, they at once reappear as an older Kerchunk to live Kerchunk ways. They work a lot harder with no time to play. You would think that it wasn't much fun, but many enjoy it, though it's a bit hard believing in dreams like when they were young. Then one day they start to feel rather tired. Once more they go off all alone. Again they patink, thus leaving behind their lives as kerchunks and ways they have known. This time they appear as Rambunis to live a Gabulian's great third and last phase. Rambunis were once most respected and wise, but Wog made them mean with his poisonous haze. Now, when a Rambuni reaches the end of his life, which was precious and rare, again he patinks for the very last time and sends a patinkle far through the air. It lands on a lunapod, making it glow. I tell you, it's really quite neat. Right at that bright moment, a new life begins, and their circle of life is complete. And so you can see that they're really the same, Kerchunks, Butterpods, and Rambunis. They once lived together in peace, all as one, till Wog's poison made them all loonies. 
They divided their hearts. They divided themselves into three separate lands, far apart. No more altogether. No longer as one. Divided by age, they weren't very smart. They started to fight. They no longer would share. They began to forget all they knew. Then they became greedy for more and more stuff. They quit taking their vitamins, too. No words can explain Walt's great, horrible plot, how his poison made everyone change. But a marvelous story is about to unfold as I tell you what happened, and things rearrange. Jerome and Mitzi together decided to see Boonta Wog on the double, but little Jerome was doubting his giffle, not knowing his doubts would cause trouble. With just a slight pause, he touched the green stone. Take us to Boonta Wog, Jerome said, but not a thing happened, just as Jerome feared, and thoughts of walking there filled him with dread. It's too far to walk to the land of Kerchunk. Jerome muttered, We just need a zark. We need to be going. We shouldn't waste time. I wanted to get there by dark. Mitzi scolded. Things really aren't all that bad. There are always good things to be found. In the sky up above, in this world that you love, it's all here if you just look around. Now Mitzi could see that there wasn't a choice. She motioned. Come on, let's start walking. Your giffle's not working. You can't have a zark. We'll get nowhere standing here talking. As the evening drew near, Jerome was not pleased. He was grouchy and mumbled a lot. Rolling her eyes, Mitzi just shook her head as the two travelers walked, walked, and walked. Your feet hurt. Reaching the top of the hill, Mitzi gasped. Look at this! This is paradise! As the dimming sun set, Zarks dotted the scene, shining brighter than fireflies. And look at this flower! Just look at it glow! It's the prettiest I've ever seen! Jerome smiled. We call it a Zulabo. We even have purple and green. They used to do something amazing at night, but I can't quite remember what. It seems like I always forget everything, like my memory is caught in a rut. Mitzi looked up at the soft, shining light the lands in the sky were creating. Jerome sighed. Those crystalline lights are orillos. They glow all night long without fading. The two fell asleep in a large patch of wid. Mitzi dreamed about all she had done, of the places she'd been and the things she had seen till the first morning light of the sun. They had just woken up when they heard a strange noise like the movement of wind in the trees. Suddenly, a lost Zark darted up to them. He oh, seemed friendly and fanned a light breeze. Mitzi beamed. I see why you feel as you do. A Zark is a beautiful creature. Oh, no. From the end of its nose to the tip of its tail, oh. right down to its very last feature. Uh -huh. I wonder what he's all alone out here for. Perhaps know. he has strayed from his mother. Do you think we could ride it? Oh, I hope. Dare we to ask? Let's do. The two of them questioned each other. The curious Zark flew right up to the two, as if tempting them both to hop on. Oh, let's he get nuzzled on. them both and then nodded his head as if nothing at all could go wrong. Okay, on the count of three, we'll jump on. Okay. Mitzi softly but anxiously said, One, two, Three, she called out as they jumped on the Zark, but the Zark threw them both on their heads. Well, this My wasn't goodness. funny. No, not one small bit. Yet the Zark appeared to be laughing. Then he helped them both on with the tip of his tail and shot up as if it were nothing. Woohoo! And yippee! <laughs> they both gleefully yelled as the wind whipped across their faces. They soared up and down and then looped round and round, high up above beautiful places. The three flew high over the Brayota Blue, past Skylands and Rogwatten Pines. When they finally reached the far end of Ramboon, they touched down in Orillo Juke Vines. I'm tired and hungry. I really must eat. There's a cozy gum blue up ahead. Right now, an Orillo with Soli sounds great. It's a drink that you'll love, Jerome said. 
Now in the Gone Blue, things did not go so well. Missy frightened the customers there. They had never seen such a creature before and did not like her blue and black hair. We won't serve your friend, the Ramboonies exclaimed. But Mitzi just smiled and stated, Just because someone doesn't look like you do isn't cause for them to be hated. Jerome cleared his throat. <clears throat> Listen to me. I have extra ruzels if only. We could have two pox of Gudoonie with spoons and two ice Dorillo with soli. Well, the payment of extra ruzels worked great, though their order cost more than it's worth. Missy chuckled and said, don't feel badly for me. I feel right at home, like on Earth. The Arilla Wissoli went into the mug as having no color or flavor. But then, in an instant, it fizzed and then changed into five flavors, layer by layer. Missy thought it looked unbelievably good, but really just was not aware that the drink would be so delicious to taste any other drink failed to compare. And oh, the Arillo Jupe Dado on top was the berry to beat all berries. Forget about orange slices, lemons, or limes. It even shamed juicy red cherries. Missy loved how the squishy mm. thing gushed in her mouth. Mm. It was bursting with flavor and fun. She mm. gobbled it up and then gulped down her drink. Then she ate her straw when she was done. She tried the gudoonie, then loudly exclaimed, mm, What's in this delectable goop? It's gooey, it's sweet, an incredible treat. Then she begged, May I have one more scoop? But the time had come to continue their quest. They must fly to the great Skyland Rawl which the Boonta Wog had obtained for himself, a once sacred skyland for all. And so the two friends and the swift yellow Zark began a most dangerous trip. As they flew up and up, the fierce sky wind of Rawl had the two travelers losing their grip. The wind pushed them around as if they were dust. It was howling and scary in the dark. The two frightened riders were near giving up, but not the determined brave Zark. Then, to make matters worse, Mitzi got blown right off and was tumbling straight down through the air. But the Zark was so quick that he knew every trick, and he caught Mitzi right by her hair. Jerome cried, We can't make it. The storm is too strong. Undaunted, bold Mitzi replied, Don't ever stop trying. No, never give up. We'll prove what we're made of inside. Jerome mocked, Blah, blah, blah. Will you ever stop all this la dee da gibberish stuff? Quit talking to me. Please just let things be. I really have had quite enough. He demanded, we have to go back right now. When a brilliant light came into view, the wind stopped its fussing, the clouds disappeared, and the terrible sky storm was through. They had actually made it. They'd reached the top. But Mitzi had nothing to say. Jerome thought to himself, I really was wrong to have spoken in such a harsh way. Gabolians are not allowed to come here. This sacred land is off limits. We have to see Wog right away, Jerome said. We should only stay a few minutes. Indescribable beauty was everywhere, yet something just didn't seem right. Perhaps they could feel Wog was watching them, for he had the three fast in his sight. They flew to the backside of Juan Tata Hall, which sits on the edge of the rim, believing that Wog would have mercy on them, believing that he'd let them in. Wog came out to meet them and beckoned them near. He was holding a poisonous gel. Poor, trusting Jerome didn't stand a chance and was sick after just one smell. He fell to the ground. I can't move. He cried out as his giffle rolled over to Mitzi. 
She picked up the ring and ran straight for Jerome, then started to feel a bit dizzy. Because she was not a gabullion by birth, the poison had little effect. Don't just stand there! Please help us! Mitzi called out. He's sick and he needs to be checked. I'm afraid I can't help you, Wog smugly replied. For his illness, I've no interventions. Mitzi was touching the Giffel's orange stone and suddenly knew Wog's intentions. She could see who he was. She knew all he had done. She knew every cold deed of his heart. She saw he was greedy and scared to grow old. Yet she knew he was clever and smart. How very sad, Mitzi thought to herself, to be so very clever and strong. And then, without thinking, she blurted right out, How can someone so smart be so wrong? It won't make you powerful, great, or strong, just because you have lots of neat things. But when you make someone else's life good... You're much richer than powerful kings. Your people are wonderful, young and old. They can learn so much from each other. The old with their wisdom, the young with their dreams. They all need to help one another. Boonta Wog was insulted. He grew very mad. At Mitzi he ran with a yell, but his foot caught a crack on the balcony floor, and he tripped and flew over the rail. In Gabul no one dies from such horrible things, but the great Buntawag fell and fell. In the world of Gabul he was not seen again, and thus ended his poisonous spell. Mitzi ran to Jerome. He was barely alive. She pleaded, you have to get up. She held her small friend, and raising his head, she gave him a drink from a cup. Hold on to your dreams with all of your might. Don't ever forget what you know to be right. The light that's within you shines so bright. I know you can make it. You'll be all right. Jerome heard Mitzi's words, and he thought to himself, Mitzi's right. She was right the whole time. Blah, blah, blah. Jerome sputtered and gave a small wink. Then they hugged, and they both were just fine. Of all the most beautiful things in Gabul, the one that could just make you cry was the magical sight of the Zulabo wind each third night when they took to the sky. Once a day, Wog stood under a Zulabo, so his memory would not be diminished. Wog's poison had grounded the Zulabo wid. He knew if they flew, he was finished. But now Wog was gone, and the Zulabo flew. Kabul held a big celebration. Rambunis, kerchunks, and small butter pods, too. Reunited with common elation. And kind-hearted Mitzi who traveled so far, was named guest of honor with pride. But the thing she liked most about being the host was having Jerome by her side. Oh, I missed you.